Hello, my name is John Rink. I'm Professor of Musical Performance Studies at the University of Cambridge. I'm also Fellow and Director of Studies in Music at St John's College. And I'm delighted to welcome you to this Open Day introduction to Performance and Performance Studies at Cambridge. I hope you'll find it an interesting survey of what we do here in Cambridge and find some aspect of it that relates to your own experience and your own interests. Let's consider first of all what makes Cambridge special for performers. The special features that we have here include our performing opportunities and the environment in Cambridge, which I've already alluded to. World-class facilities. We have unique courses in performance studies, challenging courses, which I'm going to tell you about in a minute. And I think we can claim excellent practical support across the university and the colleges from the director of performance, directors of music, and other members of our community. So it is a special environment as I'm sure you'll see if you start to explore it yourselves. Some of the features include side-by-side -side events with professionals, a huge number of societies, both in individual colleges and elsewhere. We have residencies with professional ensembles and other ensembles, a full range of music awards, and of course, many, many choirs across the colleges um, for just about everybody, all sorts of music are catered for. We have as facilities and resources, a range of libraries, instrument collections, rehearsal spaces, and quite a range of technology that might interest you, particularly in our Centre for Music and Science. As for our courses, at every single level of the TRIPOS, the undergraduate curriculum, recital options are available. In the first year, all students can take a recital option alongside other options, such as composition and an extended essay. In year two, I've convened over many years a course called Introduction to Performance Studies, which has a lecture element leading to a written examination and a recital component, component worth half of the um, course. And then in year three, in part two, as we say, you can take a number of options, including advanced performance with a solo recital or some other ensemble options, advanced skills in terms of keyboard and advanced skills in terms of choral performance. So a wide range of courses, as I said, catering for a wide range of students. Now, I think it might be useful if I say a little bit about my own interests and my related teaching, because that will give you an idea of how many members of our faculty um, relate their teaching to what they're doing as researchers. First of all, a big area of my research is on Chopin, so issues of performance practice analysis, source studies and digital resources. And I've been teaching for many years a third year course called The Music of Chopin, which feeds upon this research in a direct way. I've also been teaching courses in performance studies at both undergraduate and postgraduate levels, focusing on analysis and performance, the psychology of performance and historical performance practices. The second year course that I mentioned a minute ago, Introduction to Performance Studies, covers all of those areas and many other things. In fact, you may have seen across the Tripos a kind of pathway leading from the undergraduate course, three different levels that I've shown you, right through the MPhil into the PhD. In addition to all of that, I teach uh, dissertation students um, on a range of topics, including ones to do with performance. Now, these um, just give you an example of how a member of staff such as myself might use their research as the focal point, as the impetus for their teaching. And this feeds right through into what students are learning and doing in whatever year they happen to be studying. Now, let's start this mini lecture at square one with some really difficult but apparently simple questions. First of all, what is performance? And indeed, related to this brief talk, what is performance studies? Often I ask students, well, what is performance? How do you define it? And they have great difficulty doing so. So what we're going to do first of all is to consider what performance is before leading to the second question, what is performance studies? Now, I'm taking some of these slides from lectures that I actually give in Cambridge, so you can already experience the kind of student life uh, sitting in the classroom uh, with slides such as these uh, provoking you, if you will, into responses um, and formulating um, answers to some difficult questions. Which of the following here are performances? Playing the piano on the stage of the Queen Elizabeth Hall. Well, most people would put up their hands and say, yes, of course, this is a performance because they're thinking of a concert context. And I say, well, what about somebody who's tuning the piano on the stage? And then they say, oh, no, 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 that's not a performance. I said, well, in fact, it depends then on the circumstances. And indeed, that's the point that really follows 
in response to all of the different um, situations that I'm going to describe here. It depends on the circumstances. It depends, in short, on intention on the one hand and perception on the other. You don't have to have both, but you do need to have one for something to be considered as, to be construed as a performance. What about tuning a violin? Well, most students say, no, that's just a sort of mechanical act. But in fact, the way in which a performer tunes a violin will give a strong impression to audiences as to their approach as a musician. So in a formal concert context, the way in which you tune a violin could be construed to be part of the performance. In other words, it has what we call a performative dimension, a dimension that relates directly to what performance is and what performance does. Walking across an empty room, again, most people would say, no, the room is empty. But what if that empty room is on stage as part of a play? The interesting thing here is that it would determine the way in which you walk across the empty room if you were an actor. You would hold your head differently, you might use your arms differently, your gait would be different, and so forth. All of these different features are, again, what we call performative features because they relate directly to the qualities of performance, the qualities of an act that make it into a performance, either through intention or perception. What about making a cup of tea? Well, again, that could just be a mechanical thing that you do first thing in the morning. But then again, it could be very much part of a ritual, say the Japanese tea ceremony, or a kind of ritual, if you like, when you're making a cup of tea for a prospective uh, parent um, of a student or perhaps a, a mother-in-law or something like that. There are certain um, expectations surrounding the way in which you make the cup of tea that turn it into a performance. And then finally, a tricky one, singing the call to prayer. Um, now, my understanding is that normally this would not necessarily be considered singing by those who are carrying out the call to prayer. It would be poetic incantation in an act of worship. Um, but we may hear it as singing, depending upon our particular expectations and our particular cultural backgrounds. All of this relates to the point made by Ian Maxwell in a, a book um, included uh, in a book by Richard Schuckner, Performance Studies, 2002. Performance is not limited to those forms traditionally marked as being artistic, and any theory of performance must accordingly be generalizable to a wide range of performative practices across and between cultures, history, and conventional social categories. Well, already we're starting to see that the notion of performance is one with huge implications, it's very permeable. It's got to be generalized to this wide range of practices across all cultures, history, and so forth. This starts to become a really big task, and that is indeed the key task of what we're calling performance studies. In a book with that name um, from 2002, I mentioned a minute ago, Richard Schechner writes that there is nothing inherent in an action in itself that makes it a performance or disqualifies it from being a performance. So again, the intention or perception aspect will determine the nature of the understanding of something as a performance. He says just about anything can be studied as performance. Something is a performance when historical and social context, convention, usage, and tradition say it is. This gets back to the point I was making a minute ago. One cannot determine what is a performance without referring to specific cultural circumstances. So if you think about that person playing the piano on the stage of the QEH, um, someone tuning the piano, I've been at concerts there where at the end of the tuning, during the interval, when they're freshening up the, the piano, uh, the audience claps. And then everybody sort of laughs because they're making into a performance the so-called mechanical act of tuning a piano. Now this is with reference to specific cultural circumstances, in the sense that normally tuning is not considered performative, but they make it into a kind of performance ironically, and everybody laughs as a result, uh, which is to say that somebody who wasn't familiar with this tradition of tuning the piano in an interval would not find it at all funny, would not understand why people were clapping or laughing. Uh, this is a, uh, perhaps a, a trivial example in one sense, but it nevertheless shows that something that in no sense whatsoever would normally be understood as performative as a performance can take on that kind of meaning without much difficulty. Schechner describes seven functions of performance, including to entertain, to make something that is beautiful, to mark or change identity, to make or foster community, to heal, to teach, persuade, or convince, and to deal with the sacred and or demonic. 
Now, I often ask my students um, when I'm giving the lecture, including this slide, uh, what aspects of the lecture could be described as performance related, as performative? Well, certainly I'm trying to entertain and I might even be trying to make something beautiful. I'm probably marking or changing identity with the clothing I'm wearing. For example, the tweed jacket that I had um, on at the beginning of this video. I'm certainly trying to make or foster community and I'm teaching, persuading and convincing, or at least I would like to think so. So my lecture is certainly not just standing and, and spouting out words. It's trying to be a performance in these particular dimensions. This starts to become quite interesting. It forces us to think what aspects of different acts um, are performative. Now, there have been a number of recent developments in musicology which have fostered the rise of performance studies. And the, perhaps the most important has been since, say, 1990 or so, an increased attention to music and indeed different types of music, musics, as cultural practices in social contexts. In so-called Western art music, um, there was a very uh, prolonged period um, when the overriding way of understanding music was as something coming from a composer and being manifested in the form of a, a written score, which was meant to be realized by performers in the act of performance. But the, the notion of communication was really from composers to audiences with performers as the vessels through which that communication took place. This has been very significantly challenged in the field of performance studies, which has arisen both inside and outside the field of music, starting in theater studies. And Schechner's book from 2002 was one example, but music has really been moving ahead in recent years, in the last uh, couple of decades, in fact. So it's now well established as an area of uh, musical and musicological study um, with many, many different publications and people and so forth as a result. Now, Schechner says that performance studies does not study texts, architecture, visual arts, or any other item or artifact of art or culture as such. When texts, architecture, visual arts, and anything else are looked at, they are studied as performances. That is, they are regarded as practices, events, and behaviors, not as objects or things. Hence, this move away from studying music in the form of notated artifacts, um, which is to say scores, but rather as practices, events, and behavior. So, Musical performance studies is considering practices, events, and behaviors rather than objects. We understand the scores as part of the whole process of performance, so they're not by any means neglected. They're very, very important, in fact, as indeed composers' intentions are important in many ways. But what we're really looking at is the practice of performance, the events surrounding performance, and the behavior of people involved in performance, not just those performing, but also those who are participating as listeners, as observers. In fact, Christopher Small proposed this very interesting notion called musicking, whereby everybody who is um, attendant at um, a performance is a participant in that performance in an act he calls musicking rather than simply performing. And this is a very inclusive way of understanding the practice, event, and behavior of performance in which everybody who happens to be there in some form or another is a participant, is an actor in this musicking. Now, in 2004, uh, we established a research center um, uh, for the, uh, the study of the history and analysis of recorded music. This lasted for five years and was known as CHARM. And it, it was one of the first uh, big projects, um, well, well over a million pounds given from the Research Council, um, for the study of performance in the form of recordings. Um, I led one of the projects in it and was part of a team of for um, directors and associate directors um, who led this um, with many, many different uh, projects and um, outcomes uh, arising from it. Um, this led to a second research center, which I myself directed and which was hosted here at Cambridge, the Research Center for Musical Performance as Creative Practice. This really tried to change the way in which we were thinking about the act of live performance, whereas CHARM, its predecessor, focused on recorded performance CMPCP, which ran from 2009 to 2015, um, focused on live performance. It had three key questions, which are really very interesting ones if you think about it. First of all, in what ways are performers creative? I said a minute ago that traditionally performers were tasked to be a kind of vessel to reproduce works that composers left to us. But in fact, we know that that's, it's not so simple as that. Performers are creative. The music that they create in performance reflect their own personalities, their own priorities, and so forth, just as 
um, as I said also, um, those who are attending to uh, performances, listeners or observers, also have a creative element. This particular question has to do with performers. In what ways are performers creative? How does their creative activity, however defined, vary across different cultures, idioms and conditions? We cannot assume that their creative activity will be consistent across all of these different contexts. There will be considerable variance, but there may also be considerable commonality. And that's something that we would wish to explore. And then finally, how do musical performances take shape over time? In other words, longitudinally, through the exercise of what might be called individual and collective creativity. I said a minute ago that musicking involved all participants. In fact, that's a kind of form of collective creativity as opposed to an individual creativity, which has to do with one um, specific person. This notion of performances taking shape over time allows us to study and to consider as important processes of practice and rehearsal um, alongside actual events of performance. And in fact, in some cultures, there's a blending between the two, a much less differentiation than there is in so-called Western classical traditions, um, whereby um, performance, or if you prefer musicking, takes shape all the time and in many, many different contexts, not in those rather more formalized ones that I've just alluded to. Now, one of the projects in CMPCP, the one that I led, um, focused particularly on um, creative learning and original musical performance. And it had as one of its um, case studies, um, something called Inside the Practice Room, which was undertaken at the Royal College of Music and the Guildhall School of Music and Drama um, through two research colleagues of mine, Karen Wise and Miriam James, who put together a couple of slides I'm going to show you. And they devised, with my input, a longitudinal study. So a study over time, which involved a questionnaire, it involved a um, practice period where um, the participants kept diaries and videos of themselves uh, practicing. It involved them in performance. Uh, they were giving an examination and then there was external validation as well as their own questionnaires based upon their, their sense of how they had done in the performance, what they did in the performance. And then we conducted interviews with them and what we called participant-led video recall. We gave them videos of their performance and asked them to tell us what was important about it. And we followed the same procedure in different aspects of our study. Um, the participant-led aspect was really important because we got people to tell us what they considered to be important, what they considered to be creative about their performances. One of the most intriguing participants in this particular um, aspect of our work, the Inside the Practice Room study, was a Spanish horn player who was an exceptionally creative practicer, if you like. When um, he was asked to identify the moments during his practice sessions when he felt creative, he came up with 34 so-called creative episodes. And the interesting thing about these is not only the sheer number, far more than anybody else in the study, but the fact that most of these episodes took place without him actually playing his instrument. You can see from this pie chart that many involved the mouthpiece, the horn uh, did involve playing, the horn plus something else, but then 22 out of 34 did not involve the horn directly. Um, these episodes included singing, vocalizing, whistling, tapping, moving the body, conducting, playing the piano, talking to himself and snapping the fingers. Uh, when we videoed, uh, watched the videos of him doing these things, it was amazing to see him assimilating the music and really making it his own through these different activities. When we uh, confronted him with the, the video afterwards and said, what do you think you were doing? He, he apologized and said, oh, I wasn't really practicing when I did these things. I should have been playing the instrument. And we said, on the contrary, you were practicing in an immensely creative and effective way because you, you made the music your own. You physicalized, you internalized, you assimilated the music through these different moves, which didn't involve playing the instrument, but nevertheless ingrained into you the music in a very sort of embodied way. Um, such that you were able to perform it more effectively. And this led to the conclusion that in many cases, a lot of time is wasted by people simply going through the mechanics of performance without the physical and indeed mental engagement that they need in order to make the performance work best. Uh, this was a very interesting finding, not only from the research standpoint, from, but from a practical standpoint. It has had many implications for how we as individual performers 
go about our business and indeed how we teach performance. So this one study with this one set of conclusions um, throws up many, many different implications of relevance to us as individual performers and to how we might teach performance. So we come back to the square one question, what is performance? And I'm going to play you a video, a case study video, in which I'd like you to consider a number of questions. What does the performance consist of? You're going to see that it's far more than performance of the music, that we have to take into account things like gesture and camera angle and so forth. Indeed, who was responsible for the performance? Not just the performer, but for those who are filming the performer and conveying it to us in the particular form that we're going to see. I'm going to tell you a, a bit about my own experience of this performance, which is quite different from the one that you will have. And lastly, what performative features can be discerned and what role do they play? What aspects of the performance, broadly defined, um, can we pick up from the video and what meaning do they have? What role do we think they play? So let's watch this video and then discuss it in a minute. Well, I hope you enjoyed that video. Um, it happens to be one that I observed live in 2015. It was given by Kate Liu. Um, it's at the um, second movement of Chopin's B minor sonata, the very first section of it. Um, it's a scherzo movement, so it's the first part of the scherzo. This uh, performance took place in the international um, Chopin piano competition in the third round. Um, I was on the jury of the competition, so I observed this performance live from the back of the hall, the Warsaw Philharmonic, and didn't have the kind of close-up proximity that you've had the benefit of in the video, had quite a different impression. But I have to say that this was an absolutely riveting performance as a whole. Kate Lou's Sonata was uh, one of the finest in the entire competition, and many members of the jury felt that. In fact, uh, many of us gave it perfect scores. Um, we, I think it's very interesting to consider these questions as to what the performance consists of, because it's not just Kate Lou playing the notes. It's not just the notes that come from Chopin. It's what she does with the notes, how she plays the notes, the physical gesture, her particular um, posture at the piano, and the way in which, in general, she tends to look up at the sky. She didn't so much in this performance because there's so much technical demand placed upon her. But um, in the middle section that follows, which I'm not I'm showing you today, um, she starts looking at the sky and really communing with the music in a very um, personal way. And all of that gave a very strong impression of this kind of internalized, assimilated, embodied performance that I've been talking about. Um, we might ask uh, what role things like gender play, what role uh, race plays. These are very difficult questions to answer, but they are important ones and um, ones that we should very much consider. As for who is responsible for this performance. If we understand the performance is not just Chopin's music um, played on the piano by Kate Lou, but in fact the whole performance event, then we take into account, say, the presence of the audience, which you saw, the sense that that uh, conveyed of a very formal occasion, of great concentration. Um, the, the audience is absolutely wrapped, it's absolutely absorbed, and that gives us an impression of what the performance uh, consists of, what it means, how it uh, comes across to people. All of that is part and parcel of the meaning that is created by this performance. And hence we get back to the conclusion that I suggested a minute ago, that performance needs to be understood as a practice in a social and cultural context. It's not simply playing the notes, it's not simply realizing the composer's intentions, it goes well beyond these things, well beyond the score being brought into sound. It's the whole total performance event, and Kate Liu's performance reminds us of that. So what is performance? What is performance studies? We've given some um, answers to these questions, but there's a lot more to say. 
We've also considered what Cambridge offers students who perform and who want to learn more about performance. Again, there's a lot more to say. I hope you'll continue your explorations uh, now that you've had this taster, now that you know a little bit more than you did. I hope that's given you a good idea of what we do in Cambridge, what we offer in Cambridge, what we will offer you in Cambridge if you do apply and if you do come here. If you have any questions, please look at our website. I'm sure you'll find lots of interesting information there. And also speak to people who have been to Cambridge who know Cambridge, because I think they'll tell you that this is a pretty buzzy environment for performers and for anybody who loves performance in the way that I certainly do and that I'm sure you do. Thank you very much.